So um, that was really interesting from Mike, actually, and I think it probably covers some of the stuff I'm going to pick up on, and it's really good to hear uh, people like Mike really put in kind of practice into action about, about good employment. Um, I, I imagine we can all agree if more kind of small museums uh, had that kind of mindset, uh, we'd all be in a better place, and maybe, maybe this talk would be completely different to what I'm going to do. Um, so, yeah, really fascinating to pick up on that. Um, so, uh, I'm from uh, a, a trade union called Prospects. We are, uh, I'm going to go on to what, what we are in a bit, but uh, I was invited by the committee to come and speak, and I'm really grateful for that. Uh, I was kind of asked to speak on, uh, on this, on about trade unions and wellbeing. So, I've, I've kind of thought about that, and I've tried to kind of expand the meaning of what that means and go into a bit of what we do, how we help people, and, and what we think we can do in the sector kind of going forward. Uh, and how we do that. So a bit about myself first. Um, I'm Philip Brooks. I am currently an organiser for Prospect. So I basically work with our branches across Scotland uh, to organise them, help with recruitment, and help them kind of build themselves and strengthen their own voice of their of their workforce within their workplace. Um, before that, I actually worked in the heritage sector. I worked in Historic Environment Scotland uh, for seven years in the archive. Uh, and a few other places, um, and I was also the chair of a union branch there. So um, I come from from kind of that the, a heritage background, and hopefully that kind of gives me a bit of an insight into into what the issues are in, in the sector. And kind of I did a bit of research on what the issues are in the sector, and they are they echo with my experiences, and I'm sure they echo with your experiences. But I suppose what we're going to look at today is. Uh, what do we know the issues are and how do we deal with them, which is perhaps a more complex question. Um, so quite often when I do these talks, uh, the first thing I need to look at is what trade unions are. I think if I was doing this talk 40 years ago, um, everyone would know quite a lot about unions straight away. That's just because of the, the place they occupied within the national consciousness and within the, the kind of uh, in politics in the nation. So. Um, on a very basic level, we're democratic membership organisations that aim to improve uh, the pay paying conditions for our members in the workplace. It's, that's quite a very vague description. We do much more than that. Um, so membership organisations, we rely on our members, but and our members also run the organisation. I think that's a really key part of trade unions. We're not, the union isn't myself and it isn't uh, David, my colleague at the back, who's one of our negotiating officers. We are not the union. It's, a, it's an organisation run by our members. And we aim to further their interests within their workplaces to make their working lives better and, and kind of enact what they want us to do. Um, I think often um, what people think unions are is reflected by this picture. So I, I just often like to Google trade unions and look on the image search and see what the first thing to come for is and see what the algorithms think unions are. And they still think unions are in black and white uh, with communist slogans across their banners. Um, <laughs> We are not that, but we do have a lot in common with these people in, the, in this photograph as well, in that we uh, are all kind of working together as a collective to try and make things better. Uh, however, I'd say, unlike the people in this photo, which I think is taken in the, uh, either in the 20s or the kind of late teens, would, uh, we, we um, have much more focus on, on kind of issues like wellbeing and, and making workplaces more equal, well as this is quite a masculine kind of thing, and that's kind of not what we are anymore. Um, we do this by uh, working with employers. So we collectively bargain with them, which is we represent groups of workers, and we put forward what they want, and we try and negotiate outcomes on things like pay in terms of conditions. When I say terms of conditions, by the way, I mean things like leave, I mean things like hours, but I also mean a whole range of things around Policies is another one. So we negotiate policies, we make policies better, we make them work for workforces, uh, and that can include anything regarding kind of disability policies, um, so maternity policies, paternity leave, whatever. All all those kind of range of things are all well within our remit. Um, this all stems from a belief that the best people to um, to negotiate and to and to say what terms and conditions they want are the workforce themselves. Uh, that's the kind of core belief of trade unionism, that, that you as staff know better than uh, kind of employers and chief executives uh, as, as to what works best for you within the workforce. And if you are given that voice to do what you want, then, then you are likely to have better conditions and better outcomes because you'll be better motivated to do things. Um, probably one of the biggest misconceptions about trade unions is that we, we have an interesting kind of 
smashing employers and and stopping them doing what they want to do that's absolutely false um we absolutely want people to succeed and want to work with employers to do it so that's just a bit of a background on what trade unions are uh, prospect who i'm who i work for so we are a union of 150,000 members based across the uk in a massive range of sectors public sector heritage energy aviation communications science broadcasting and a few others so it's it's a wide range. You'll find a lot of unions tend to do that now. We have over 8,000 members in the heritage sector. <coughs> they work traditionally largely in kind of curatorial and professional roles, but also more so in, in other roles, public facing roles, um, and, and other kind of parts of the sector. Yeah, we've got a strong record in the heritage sector across the UK. And we're the recognised union, which means we have a legal right to, to bargain on pay terms and conditions and other things in pretty much all the big national heritage organisations. So Historic Environment Scotland, National Museums, National Libraries, National Galleries, National Trust for Scotland and the National Trust uh, in England. The Botanics, both Botanics in Edinburgh and the Botanics at Kew. The VNA, Science Museum Group, British Museum, British Library, Historic England and so on. Pretty much all of them. Um, I will touch upon later kind of how we want to kind of help people who don't work in those, those large organisations as well. Uh, we're politically independent, which means uh, we're not affiliated to any political party. Uh, but we are political. Our work is inherently political. It's, it's what trade union work is. Uh, workplace rights and your and equality are political issues. And sometimes people say we're not political. We are. We're just not affiliated to a political party. So I kind of thought about what do we mean by well-being at work. I think often when, when people talk about well-being at work, um, what, the, what they think it means is kind of quite an airy-fairy kind of thing about, about kind of taking more walks and taking breaks and, and kind of doing kind of sort of light stuff around that sort of stuff. I think um, somewhere I was aware of kind of that their big well-being thing was just kind of to do more mindfulness. And that's, that's not what well-being is, in my view. And it's why, it, it's, why it's so central to what we do. Um, well-being in the workplace just touches on absolutely everything. Um, so, if you think about um, well, well-being, can, can derive from how much you're paid and how much you enjoy your job, the conditions you work in, both physical conditions and also uh, the rights you have at work. And I think uh, often we need to look a lot more at addressing the root causes of these issues rather than just the symptoms. So I think often when people think of well-being issues, they think of symptoms and how to how to mitigate symptoms that have come from uh, issues caused at work rather than what's actually causing those issues and how we address them. Um, so why are workplaces so important to, 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 our, to our well-being and everything? Uh, so I worked out that we spend roughly 20% of our lives at work every year. That's if you work a standard week, standard hours, whatever, with, with standard holidays and weekends. Um, everything in our workplace has an effect on our well-being. So, um, and everything in the workplace is a union issue. So if it's in the workplace and it has an effect on your wellbeing, it's an issue that unions want to be involved in. Why is it an issue that unions want to be involved in? Because it affects our members who are the staff and therefore we want them to have a say in how they can improve it. Um, there are many causes of uh, stress and mental health issues at work. So they can be caused by health and safety. Um, it can be caused by fair pay. If people feel like they're not paid properly, it's, it causes a lot of stress and if at a very base level, if you're not paid enough for your job and you have financial issues, that's a well-being issue. Uh, progression, are you, do people feel like they're progressing enough in their work? This is, as we'll find in the later slides, I think this is probably one of the key issues within the sector about people. It was mentioned, um, Mike mentioned about when he was working in, uh, in industry about the idea that once you had a job, you had to wait for someone to die to do it. When I speak to members in Heritage, there is that feeling amongst a lot of them that they are waiting for somebody to retire before they can progress. And that could be 10, 20 years uh, of waiting and then there's no guarantee you'll progress. Stability and security, another kind of big one within the sector. Are, are the jobs stable and are they secure? Are, are they just, are they going to be here next year? Are you relying on a, a last minute funding bid to secure your jobs? It's not a good place to be in as an, as an employee. And it's also not good for the employer if they have staff who are constantly looking at moving on from their job because they don't know whether it will be there soon. So these are all issues that we think affect uh, employees, but also affect employers. Um, 
terms and conditions and workplace culture was one that Mike mentioned. That's a huge issue, and I, I will kind of get onto that later on. Such a vague kind of nebulous idea of, of how cultures work in workplaces. But Mike touched upon, do, do, they, do they encourage em, employees to, to stay? Do they, do they encourage em, uh, em, the right people to join the workplace? And do they kind of give a diverse workforce? So I've kind of split this into um, what, what, we, what we have found the workplace issues to be in Heritage. This is based on both us talking to our members, which we do very regularly, well, all the time, pretty much, and also some surveys that we did. Um, a lot of these are quite out of date now just because they were um, pre-pandemic, and I'm sure, as you found, anything kind of pre-2020 is a lot less useful than you might think it is now, but I think they have some usefulness and they sort of illustrate trends that are, um, that are, that are, are still uh, relevant. So I want to look at kind of, yeah, three areas about, about how, how these issues came about. So the first one is, is around work-life balance. Um, so we found that 33% of um, people said their work-life balance was about right. Um, which meant that uh, only 33%, which, me which meant that um, the rest of them, 67%, for their work-life balance wasn't right. This is within the heritage sector of our members we surveyed. And 65% of those surveyed had reported adverse effects uh, related to work-life balance. So a really big issue. People feel like they're, they're working too much and not getting the benefits of that. Um, on a very basic level, uh, if people are working far more than their contracted hours, that's both kind of, you're giving away your time for free, and also the employer is getting something for free, and it's gonna have long-term adverse effects. It usually means, which I'll get onto the next bit of what it means. Um, has the pandemic made it worse, is the question. We, we don't have any kind of stats on this, but um, we're pretty sure it has from, from a lot of the work we've done. Uh, that's partly because of the rise of a, a kind of always-on culture. Um, so, I suppose, certainly, uh, at least in the early days of the pandemic, there was this idea of were you working from home or were you just sleeping in the office? It became an idea that you were just constantly able to do work, so kind of did. And I, I imagine a lot of people found that. And it became a lot easier to reach people, to ask them to do stuff, and people couldn't switch off. We did quite a big campaign called The Right to Disconnect, which we've, we're still having going on, which is the idea that people should have a legal right to, to switch off from work when they are outside their contracted hours. It's something that exists in quite a lot of European countries already, and we've had a lot of traction on, uh, on that within um, Scottish government at least, and hopefully within the UK government in getting that as, as a legal right for people. 33% um, of home workers said, said their mental health got worse over the pandemic. So that's quite a high amount, that's a third of people said that it declined, largely or partly due to them uh, working from home all the time, not getting out, not seeing people, but also having that ability to be contacted constantly. Um, so kind of thinking about why these issues arise, I think a big one is, is resourcing. Um, so 79% of uh, the respondents of the 2018 survey uh, had reported an increase in their workload from 2014. That's a big increase. I, we can be pretty sure that trend has continued to increase. As resources um, are cut, the amount of work you are having to do isn't cut. Um, it stays the same. So obviously, resources go down, but the work stays the same. But the amount of work stays the same. So the amount of work people are having to do as individuals goes up and up and up. I'm sure it's something you're all finding in terms of um, being asked to do just a bit more of somebody else's job if someone leaves, roles not being replaced, and so on. 49% um, of respondents said that opportunities for professional development had decreased. So not only having to do more work, you're actually getting less chance to develop within your role. And uh, pay remains low compared to similar jobs in other sectors. Uh, that will surprise nobody at all in this room, that, that pay within the sector is, is, is low compared to similar jobs. So how do we, so, so what's actually causing this is, um, is policy. So policy at a national level is often kind of the root cause of, uh, of these issues. And it's one of the things that we can look to address later on in this presentation. So 82% um, believed cuts were having an adverse effect on the sector. Um, the cuts to the sector since kind of 2010 uh, have been very drastic and it is a completely different sector to what it was 10, 12 years ago. Um, central funding has been replaced by project-based funding. 
and, it, and the result is having um, it results in more insecure work and having to jump through hoops. So rather than having a solid set of funding that would be there for the work that he's doing, it's done on a project by project basis. I'm sure you all know, and that means that to guarantee funding, you have you have to meet certain criteria. Um, and there's a feeling that policy sectors don't understand the sector, what it needs, and and how it operates. Um, and weak policy, it allows for insecure work. So kind of going backwards from that, bad policy results in poor resourcing, which causes issues for individuals and workforces. However, um, I'm, I'm concerned that no one's going to get this reference because there might be people who are too young to know what Linus Morissette is. But um, <laughs> imagine you all and you all remember the kind of mid to late 90s. Um, <laughs> I always think the big irony of, of sort of well-being for, our, for, for our members within the heritage sector is that heritage is all about other people's well-being. Um, the work you do day to day is about, is about creating something that people enjoy. Uh, and the, there are loads of studies that show that people who participate in heritage and culture and the arts are themselves mentally happier and healthier. Um, they also help social inc inclusion educate young people from a whole range of backgrounds. Um, and uh, from a purely financial ang angle, the heritage sector generated uh, 20.5 20 billion pounds for the treasury in 2015, or 1.1% of uh, GDP. And for every pound that's uh, invested in the sector, it makes between four and six pounds back. So it's a bit of a no brainer. If you were to have an investment yourself that made that return, you'd be putting a hell of a lot more into it than, than um, than decision makers currently are. So 386 jobs were supported in heritage and tourism in the UK, and that was in 2015 as well. And it's probably back up around there now. So the other thing I often touch upon is that people within the sector really enjoy their jobs, or at least what their jobs are supposed to be, rather than often not what they've actually turned into. So, how do, so what do we kind of do about that is the next question. Um, so what unions can do is based on what their members want them to do is the first thing I would say. Um, we don't come in with kind of big ideas about how we want to change workplaces and how we want to change sectors or anything. What we do is we speak to people and we ask them how they think it could change and then we assist them with that. Um, we have grown within heritage and this is a really important step. I think unions often talk about membership figures quite a lot and the reason that's important is just because uh, the more members we have, the more powerful the voice becomes. If you have an organisation and you have, you say you're speaking on behalf of, what, a couple of hundred people, you're not going to listen to. If you say, if you say you're uh, speaking on behalf of uh, tens of thousands of people, including the entire kind of senior management of a sector, then that's a lot more powerful. So we are growing within the area and this means that our voice will get stronger and we will have more opportunities to, to kind of raise issues in, in places that matter. When I say places that matter, I'd kind of say there's a few levels that we can go in at. Uh, we've mentioned workplace levels for recognised, uh, for recognised um, employers. That's, um, by recognised, sorry, I mean employers where we have membership of a certain level and we're legally allowed to negotiate. Uh, but there's also kind of engagement at, at, at kind of um, governmental level and at kind of um, sectoral bodies and all this kind of stuff. Um, getting recognition in more areas allows us to improve terms and conditions and health and safety. And the more areas we do that, the more it puts pressure on other parts of the sector to do that as well. Uh, we use our voice where it matters. Uh, so this is lobbying decision makers at all levels and sharing support uh, and to support the sector alongside other bodies and to improve <coughs> employment law. So we want to work with other bodies who want to do this to, to raise the, the kind of issues that are affecting the sector where it matters. So if, if this is government level, then we'll, then we'll raise it there. Uh, we, were, we were very successful in the pandemic. Uh, some of my colleagues in London were able to, to ensure that furlough was applied fairly to, um, to staff in some of the national museums in London, which it wasn't going to be otherwise until we kind of raised that issue and said, no, you should be applied to this as though they are public sector workers, not as though they are charity workers, which was the difference. And it, and it kind of made a big difference to them. It meant, it meant they got full pay rather than 80% of their pay for the period they were furloughed. Um, yeah, bringing together reps and members from across the sector to, to address issues and share data. 
So that's about getting people together and, and asking them what their issues are and how we do it and running campaigns that get results. So kind of on, on this note, um, something we're really keen to do and which I, I'd like to talk to people about today if people want to do is, is get people together from parts of the sector that have perhaps not been represented too well by unions in the past. So when I gave our list of recognised um, workplaces, that was mainly kind of large organisations. Traditionally, that's a lot of the way unions have worked because it's where the membership's based and it's where you represent. You, you have something to negotiate with and you have lots of members there. What we've done less of is kind of help with small organisations. Obviously, the model I described of kind of collective bargaining and, uh, and um, uh, recognition won't really work if you've got three or four employees, but what will work is getting all those together within one big group to discuss their issues and trying to set things like sectoral standards and uh, working across the sector to, to set kind of minimum terms and conditions and um, uh, sort of pay levels and, and, and sort of working out what the, what the sort of fair pay is across the sector and stuff like that. So we're really keen to, to work more across the sector with small uh, museums and galleries and get people more involved at doing that at a sectoral level. Uh, it's something that we know it works, because we've, we've done it with archaeologists already. Uh, we have a big archaeologist branch, which is just all archaeologists working at a whole range of small units that themselves individually maybe have very few employees, but when we brought them all together as an archaeologist group, they've been able to make big advances within the sector as a whole. Um, so that's kind of something we're really keen to do, and um, really keen to talk to anybody who's interested in that about. Um, another lead we have is, is within our work within, within government. So we work quite closely with the Scottish Government on something called the Fair Work Convention. I've heard somebody mention it already today. It's a uh, framework that was set up by the government um, to embed fair work within workplaces, within all of them. Unions are absolutely central to this. Um, in fact, it's the, the, the Scottish Government's definition of, of, um, of people having a, an effective voice within their workplaces, having a recognised trade union within it, and the ability to join a trade union. So, yeah, it's, it's the idea that every workplace in Scotland, by 2025, it's very ambitious, should have effective voice, which is defined like that. Opportunity, that's opportunity to, to progress and to do stuff within the workplace. Security, that's fairly self-explanatory. Fulfilment, quite a vague one, but really important, the idea that you have a fulfilling role and respect, just being respected at work. And they are really our values, and it's really good to see the Scottish Government taking those values and putting them at the centre of, their, of, of what they do. But just because they've said they're going to do that, it doesn't necessarily mean they will do it in the right way. And our role as unions is to make sure that they do that in the way that, that actually benefits uh, staff and members and doesn't just kind of um, provide a, a kind of certification to say you're doing it when you're actually not. Um, so, um, one last thing I was going to touch upon, actually, having picked up on the other, talk, other talks, was about, um, well, two things, actually. One was about uh, disability access, which was addressed in the first one. I just thought I'd pick up on a few things that came on. Um, it is a sector that has struggled to widen its um, participation of, of, of who works in the workforce, and it's something we're really keen to do. How can we make that work? And in our view, that's about working with employers and letting them know the benefits of it. Um, the benefits of unions are rather than you doing that on your own, you have a body behind you who can back you up with professional staff and tell you and tell the employer why this is actually a benefit to them to hire a wide range of staff. We all know it is, but sometimes we don't necessarily know how to um, get that across, although the first speaker obviously did. Um, and there was a final thing about, about changing cultures collectively that I want to pick up on. Um, that's a really difficult thing. And the thing I mentioned about getting everyone together and setting those minimum standards, that's the kind of start with it, to make it become the sector we want it to become rather than the sector it is at the moment. Um, and having those employee-led networks, it's really vital, we think, that, that everything's led by employees rather than by consultants or managers who are, who are kind of... Uh, passing down ideas from up high. That doesn't mean, by the way, that we don't want to work with these groups. Uh, we, we want to work with employers to make the whole sector better, not against them, uh, against their interests, because it's our strong belief that if we work together, then we're all better off. Um, uh, this is my email address if you want to contact me at any point about anything. Um, 
and I will be hanging around for lunch and probably a bit after, and my colleague David Avery is at the back as well, and he's um, recently taken over as our negotiations officer covering the whole of the heritage sector in Scotland now. So he is in charge of negotiations and is a full-time official for all our heritage branches in Scotland, um, and will also be kind of working on, on trying to help the sector as a whole. And that's me. Any questions? Thank you.